It's March 9th, 2023. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode 245 of Rook. The Iranian economy is a dark comedy. I'm Gian Gomeshi, hello to you from Toronto. Salam dostan aziz, durud bar shoma. The Iranian economy is a dark comedy. That description is courtesy of our first guest today, Dr. Mahdi Khotsi, an economist based in Vienna. And his reasons don't take too much to master because the economic situation in Iran is a disaster. Here's the recipe for catastrophe. Take incompetent management, endemic corruption, increasing isolation, the effects of ongoing sanctions, self-interested decision-making, the suppression of basic rights and a volatile socio-cultural environment, and throw them all in a blender. Voila! Ongoing and worsening economic miseries in the Islamic Republic of Iran. And yes, I know, you have some friends who just came back from North Tehran and told you everything is just fine might be a wee class issue that's masking the decline. Because here's what is actually happening on the ground for those paying attention. Iranians had formed long lines in front of exchange offices in recent days, hoping to acquire increasingly scarce dollars. Many have seen their life savings evaporate as the local currency is tanked. The rial is down 100% since Raisi took office. The collapse of the currency and inflation, that is significantly above 50%, has been eating away at standards of living. Basic goods like meat have become an unattainable luxury. The Iranian economy is a dark comedy. Try to imagine what is happening in a country where over 50% of the population are living under the poverty line. Try to imagine what is happening in a country where only 11% of women over the age of 15 are currently employed. Imagine what that does to aspirations, human relations, and the hopes and dreams of younger generations. They are jobless, they are repressed, they are confined, and they are suppressed. And this is part of the push for the regime change in Iran. This is why almost the entire country want to see these mullahs gone. The regime's only hope is the windfall of a nuclear deal, the JCPOA. And this is why we have to keep Western dealmakers at bay. Because a nuclear deal stands to give this terrorist regime new life and prolong the inevitable end of these dark comedic days. In the meantime, to raise revenue, Iran has increased its oil exports to more than 1.2 million barrels a day, and now China is their new powerful friend. And the Biden administration equivocates rather than bring that rendezvous to an end. In turn, while the people suffer, the regime is increasing funding to state broadcasting propaganda, religious organizations, and of course, the IRGC. $3 $3 billion to amp up the crackdown campaign, a 28% rise in funding over last year. Hey, when a totalitarian theocracy tells you who they are, pay attention to what you hear. To our friends and families back in Iran, we can only hope you are coping okay. To our listeners and followers inside the country, here's a wish for a better day. Here's to a future where Iran builds back its esteem and the Islamic Republic is a fading bad dream. Coming up on this new edition of Rook, economist and academic Dr. Mahdi Godsi in Vienna and the Kamanche master Kurosh Babai live in the Rook studio in conversation and performance, plus the Rook Roundtable. This is Rook, episode 245. The Iranian economy is a dark comedy. all of you listening around the world here we are from our studio in toronto and uh coming up dr mahdi Khodsi, as i was just mentioning in that essay the iranian economist based in vienna um, works at the vienna institute for international economic studies he has actually he has two phds wow right one was the enough. iranians <laughs> can't just get one phd yeah yeah uh, <laughs> It's amazing he's not a doctor and an engineer as well as being a, <laughs> a double economist. Anyway, uh, he's very he's 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 doing great work in terms of really boiling down what's going on with the Iranian mm-hmm. economy. In as much as you can do that without being on the ground inside Iran, right. 
um, he does sort of issue that disclaimer. Um, so uh, I really thought we so much of what we talk about uh, intersects in terms of the situation in Iran, intersects mm-hmm. with with. Uh, economic disparity, the economic crisis, mm-hmm. uh, and it comes up quite regularly. Yes. Like when we're doing our roundtable, I think once a week you go, and the currency yep, is tanking. Exactly. And I'm actually really excited to hear what he has to yeah, say. Yeah, I kind of want to. I, I mean, I was actually talking to him before um, before we started recording. Uh, he's sitting waiting in Vienna right now for us. But uh, and, and I said to him, you know, forgive me. I'm going to ask you some elemental mm-hmm. questions. You know, our entire audience audience is not made up of economists, right. so I want I want you to explain things like what are the implications. Mm-hmm of the tanking real, what does it really mean against the American dollar, you know, stuff like that. Um, and and he's he's the one who pointed out, I mentioned in that essay, where the, the current revenues of where the regime is spending, mm-hmm. he calls it this this trinity, this, uh, the, the, the three places where it's going, which right. is religious organizations, state media, and the IRGC. So, <laughs> so while the, Iranian people are unable to afford, you know, meat and milk and eggs and right. whatever, the majority of them, the, you know, un, now over 50% under the poverty mm-hmm. line, right? Uh, they're spending money on the IRGC to, you know, ensure that the regime, well, in as much as they can, it stays it's stable, Priorities. right? So Dr. Matthew would see, and then something very different after that, we're back to our sort of variety show uh, Rook days because uh, after uh, Dr. Gotzi in uh, in Vienna, we're going to come back here to our Rook studio, and in the Rook studio, the great Iranian Canadian Kamanche player, Kurosh Babai, who has played with everybody, mm-hmm. everybody, uh, every, name someone. The Comcar. That's right, yes. Adeshia Kamkar, but I, you I, knew that. I knew that, yeah. that's right. <laughs> but if you were to say, for example, Reza Rouhani or Shahram Nazari right. or uh, Ali Reza Gorbani, he is, he's played with all those folks. A very, uh, an acclaimed Kamanche player who ended up coming to Canada just a few years ago. He's going to perform in the Rook studio and talk about his new piece that he's written uh, and recorded um, on the revolution. His name, uh, his name. <laughs> he has recorded it with Fariba WD, who is a... Uh, a uh, friend of our show mm-hmm. and a great singer here in the Toronto area. So we'll get to all of that with Kurash Babai later in the show. Mahdi Khodsi coming up on the Iranian economy uh, and the dark comedy, as I mentioned in the opening essay there. But let's first talk about um, what's going on. Well, first of all, welcome back. Thank you. We missed you for the last few days, although yeah, Masa Mortazavi on Monday was... Such a great round table. I she's listened great. to it. It was yeah, wonderful. She's so solid. Um, so I was thinking in terms of topics today, mm-hmm. uh, plus ça change, plus ça la même chose, you know, like the more things change, the more things <laughs> the stay more, the yeah. same. Uh, last week we were talking about poison attacks. Yes. This week we're st- we still have to talk still. about poison attacks. Um, any any new developments? So I was actually thinking about it. And like you said, you know, we, we've talked about it for the last couple of weeks and we're still continuing to talk about it and with good reason. But instead of giving stats and numbers and things like that, because I think we've already talked about that and everyone at this point knows you know how many thousands of, of school girls were affected and I don't want to go into the numbers but there was something interesting that I read um, in the Guardian on Tuesday I believe it was and um, they had reported that the deputy interior minister appeared on state TV and actually announced for the first time that there were arrests connected to the poisoning of the schoolgirls. So they came out, or he came out rather, on uh, on state TV and said, you know, we've made arrests. And I think it was in response to the fact that so many people were saying, you know, what the hell are you doing? You can easily find, like we said yeah, on, on yeah. numerous shows, you know, you could easily find. But these are bullshit arrests, of course. surely. Well, that's it's what I was like, getting didn't they, to. Didn't they arrest someone with Masa I mean, he too, so, yeah. Exactly. So this is what I was getting to. So they, the first he came out and he said, you know, we've made these arrests. Then, within minutes of saying that these arrests have been made in five different provinces and a full investigation is, you know, being conducted and and these things, he then went on to say, you know, these individuals, they were misguided and they meant no harm. So in the same breath, he's now defending the individuals who have been arrested, which is just... I mean, what they accidentally poisoned, well, well, this is the thing. terminally I mean, poisoned how, how university students and school girls, yeah. Yeah. and and how can we even accept that when there's thousands of girls still in hospitals, still recovering, gasping for air? 
um, you know, I mean, that video we saw yeah. a couple of days ago. Or Sometimes I feel week. like even reporting this, even talking about this stuff is like, it's like platforming that foreign minister on CNN. You know, it's like, should we even mention yeah. what they say? Because it's always such nonsense. You know, part of the reason I like talking about it, at least for the round table, is so that if anyone is listening and has seen this and has thought, okay, well, you know, maybe they made arrests. We like, can debunk we that. Can, exactly. Yeah, yeah. At least I, we can point the fact, point yeah. out the fact that, you know, this is bullshit. So yeah. um, that, that and, was... And, and also... Uh, as much as I appreciate the fact that there are some, are you know, there's a percentage of our audience. I think it's about twelve percent, which is non-Iranian. Mm-hmm. The the reality is our our show, our intent yes. is is inside baseball, as we say. It's like we're we're inside the Iranian community mm-hmm. talking about our issues, our intra-community yeah. issues. So there's not as much of a, a, an incentive as there would be if we were on CBS to explain everything because most people listening are rolling their eyes as soon as they hear what the yeah. regime has said. They're yeah. not going, oh, I guess there's both sides. There's two sides. You know. I mean, I'm happy to hear that most people are, are there now, so that's good. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention in regards to this story, this evolving story about the poisoning of the schoolgirls is... Um, this came out to be really contradictory because on Monday, um, Khamenei actually made a statement saying that, you know, those responsible would be severely punished and he took a very, very strong stance. And then now you have this individual coming out and saying, well, you know, they were misguided and he was kind of being soft and whatnot. So, and the reason I wanted to point that out is, and I think we talked about this on a couple of shows back, is there's this like inner turmoil and chaos yeah. and whatnot amongst yeah. individuals who are part of the regime because you have the Supreme Leader saying one thing, really making a strong stance or trying to and then here you have someone like this minister coming out and saying completely the the opposite yeah they're clearly not as unified as i'm sure they would like to be in terms of uh showing a common front to uh and we've seen that a lot we've seen that Mm -hmm. a lot we've seen we've seen progeny we've seen like granddaughters and and cousins and aunts of of the of these uh regime mullah leaders uh defect from their own families that's right right. and i mean this isn't a surprise but you know speaking of um defections of family members and granddaughters and things like that in the midst of um all of these quote-unquote investigations that they've been doing they've also rounded up and arrested um journalists dissidents and uh, retired academics who actually used to teach at some of these schools that have now been poisoned so i mean it's just it's complete chaos for lack of a better word but Nothing that I think most Iranians weren't expecting. Yesterday was International Women's Day. Yes. And um, uh, there was a lot of great stuff being posted. Although I have to say I felt like there's been um, correctly uh, so much attention in the Iranian social media on how... Uh, incredible the brave women who've been leading this mm-hmm. uh, thing have been since the beginning that that it didn't feel it used to be like International Women's Day is the one day where everybody talks yes. about it, the, the yesterday felt like another day that you know when when we're acknowledging the mm-hmm. important um, female uh, leadership uh, and and brave women who have been you know not just enduring uh, things at the hands of this regime but but fighting back at the front lines but there were a couple of things that I think we're we're great that I'm sure everybody mm-hmm. you know where I'm probably I'm going to mention that viral, viral video of the video, dancing. Yes, yes. And even and we've seen a fair bit of this. So what so let's explain what it is. Yeah. It's yeah. So there was a video um that a uh, group of I mean I don't even know how old they were but young girls let's say maybe they, the they 20s can't be, or yeah, something I mean, yeah. they must be in their 20s or something along that age range um there were five girls and so the video shows these five girls standing in um an apartment co- or in front of an apartment complex called Ekbaton, um which is in tehran somewhere i don't know the exact specifics but it's in tehran and so the video depicts these five girls um dressed in crop tops and kind of jeans or cargo pants and very you know the same type of leisure wear that you would see in a city like Toronto or LA or anywhere else. Um, No hijabs, of course. And they're dancing and they're actually doing a dance that's gone viral on TikTok and other social media platforms. Um, And I can't remember what the song is called, but I think it's by Selena Gomez and somebody else. Um, And so they're dancing and the end scene of this video or the finishing scene is one of the girls actually um, makes it seem like she's like shooting a football or a soccer ball let's say into a net and it's like a victory so she's showing this victorious kind of um like statement she's making a statement so to speak so that that's the video that we're talking about and and it's when you see a lot of people sharing something sometimes it becomes kind of mundane it's like Mm -hmm. oh yeah that that thing with the girls dancing but it was really so 
fucking cool. There were so It much- was so cool like yeah. to see this. First of all, super brave, mm-hmm. right? Let's not forget that, you you know, as we know. Dancing, no hijab. You're not the, supposed the, to dance. The clothing, you're not supposed tops to, yeah. and, you know. Yeah, and they're just, they're going for it. It was just so cool. I was so, I was proud. Yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, have a guy sitting in Toronto <laughs> and I was like, this is so cool. Way to go. You're the best. You know, there were so many things. I mean, the fact that they released it on International Women's Day, or, or I think they did. Um, there must have been some sort of symbolism in that. Um, the fact that, you know, it was timely in the sense that there's been conversation about um, subdued kind of activity inside Iran. Um, the school girls have been, you know, targeted, things like that. And then to have a bunch of girls dancing and kind of saying, screw you. No, yeah. it's not subdued. They're not going to stop us. It was kind of a big symbolic I mean, I, like, fuck you to, well, you, what to was everybody. So, what was really. so cool I mean, about it was there was, it was there was really no there was no compromise. Like they weren't. We've seen some videos where the the person's wearing a mask. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Or they shield their they put their hair yeah. in their face, or no. all of which is understandable. You know, if you're in Iran, if you're outside of Iran, you know, come on. Mm-hmm. Uh, but inside Iran, obviously, it's uh, and and. Uh, uh, they, you can see their faces. They're not backing down at all. No, I it was so. It was. It was truly empowering. I mean, I hope that nothing. I hope they're not tracked down. And well, you know, uh, I suspect if something does happen, it wouldn't happen right away. It'll be like a month from now. We'll find out that they were, you know, rounded up or something. Yeah. But I feel like that's the fear with any time we see any sort of video or show of bravery. From, but they would from have thought that time. through. Oh, absolutely. Obviously. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But I think more than anything else, it was yet another show of resilience and this in this ongoing fight that these young girls and women have been leading in Iran. And also the, the timeliness of it, I think, was what was really, really for me, it's what made me most proud because, you know, with the with the poisonings going on, with the girls being the target yeah, recently, yeah. with it being International Women's Day, yeah. all of that symbolism together and to have them do that was just... Incredible. By the way, the, one of the things in terms of uh, the situation for women in Iran, uh, one of the things when I was researching this uh, Dr. Matthew Rossi, which I, mm-hmm. I'm going to talk to him about in a few mo- moments when he joins us from Vienna, the economist is uh, that stat that I mentioned in the essay. Mm -hmm. Um, I said 11%. What that actually is, is one out of every nine, one out of every nine women over the age of 15 in Iran has no work, is not employed. I mean, can you imagine? And that's considering the literacy rate. I mean, the exactly. education rate. I want to actually talk about that's, Well, that's the thing. The yeah. regime trumpets this like, we've had all these women go to university yeah. and, and you yet know, they can't find jobs. They're not, for all kinds of reasons, right. they're not allowed to work or they can't or, they're, or the economy is, is such, in such mm-hmm. shoddy shape. I'm, sh- I'm sure this statistic isn't about the more well-off folks in the right. urban centers and this is more reflective of the whole country and mm-hmm. but it is a devastating statistic but one in nine women does not cannot is not employed uh, I mean that is just I mean shockingly scary in terms of what's going on in that country no that that suggests that the gender apartheid this is what I want to put to him mm-hmm. is not we talk about gender apartheid in terms of the forced rules of what you have to wear your head job mm-hmm. or you know you, the, the the rights that, that you don't, don't have this is another form of it of course I mean, economic it, complete economic disparity not that there's the men are particularly employed either the employment is, is unemployment is skyrocketing in, yeah. in the country but but it, it, it's better off for men Absolutely. than it is for women and you do still see that difference and I mean it's no wonder that you talk to so many you know we we have we have spoken to women in Iran and they all say there's no hope in terms of careers and, and future and things like that and I mean this is the stat just I was further. thinking about one of the women we spoke to recently I think it was uh, a woman in, in Shiraz who was mm-hmm. in her 20s and and when I said why are you so angry what, what, or what where are you at right now and she said I'm so beyond the the, the rights and all of that right. I just want to be able to work I want to be able yeah. to make some money I want to be able to have a life you know this is what they're talking about mm-hmm. right exactly um, you mentioned gender apartheid. That was actually one of the other things I wanted to discuss is um, this campaign and petition that was mm. shared because this was shared um, yesterday as well, so on International Women's Day. Um, and so the the petition is called uh, End Gender Apartheid. The website, if anyone hasn't seen it, it's a very informative website, is um, www.endgenderapartheid.today. Mm. So if anyone wants to 
sign the petition or read up on it, um, I would highly suggest doing so. Essentially, it's a campaign, um, a petition, and a global call to action to end gender apartheid in Iran and in Afghanistan. And um, the campaign's mission is basically to utilize moral, political, and legal tools um, to mobilize the international action against and ultimately to end gender apartheid. Um, and it's signed and backed by some very, very, very influential um, women, both in the Iranian and Afghan communities. Um, some of the key names, I mean, individuals that we all have come to know, I guess, um, Shirin Ebadi, Mehrangiz Kar, Masih Ali Najad, um, Gwad Shifta Farhani. There's just so many names and, and the full list of um, signatories is on there. But for anyone who hasn't had a chance to check it out, definitely do. Right on. Um, anything else before we get to our first guest? Um, I mean, another viral video that I'm sure a lot of people saw was um, the video of Hamid Esmailiun mm. from the uh, PS752. Resigning. Or, or, yes. Or, or what was it? Uh, the yeah, resignation, I guess re yeah. resigning from the Families Association. Right? Yeah. So I thought that was um, that was definitely an interesting video. So um, for anyone who hasn't seen it, um, Hamid Esmailiun resigned effective March 7th as the president and spokesperson of the Association of Families of Flight PS752. Um, and in his resignation video, he mentioned that, you know, he'd be maintaining his position as on the board of directors and will continue to play a role in, in fighting towards truth and justice for the association, but that someone else will be taking over as spokesperson and president. Um, and he'll be focusing more towards... Um, I guess the ongoing revolution in Iran, mm -hmm. being one of the opposition leaders. Yeah, so I I'm guess, I'm yeah. very interested to see you know what that'll mean and, and what kind of a role he's going to play, where that puts the coalition. See if we should get Hamid back on the show. Yeah, that would be wonderful to be able to could, talk yeah. to him yeah, and, and sure. find out what uh, what his latest thinking is. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely. Um, all right. We are coming to you on rookmedia.com. It's there that you can link to all of our platforms. We are, we're on this ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. So we're on a bunch of different platforms, SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Instagram, CastBox. Uh, you can subscribe on any of those, or um, you can, if you like to see some visuals with Rook, um, you can watch as well as you listen on YouTube. And if you like your Rook descriptions and bulletins in English and Persian, check us out on Telegram. We crowdsource to keep uh, things going here, which means that you can support us, actively support us, especially if you're a regular listener of Rook, uh, listener of Rook and we know there's um, thousands of you. So uh, <laughs> please join us. Uh, join the Rook member um team here the the rook member army uh go to our website rookmedia.com uh, r-o-q-e rookmedia.com and press the support us button where you can go to our patreon page and become a rook member by uh, subscribing or signing up there for either the bronze silver or gold membership at the patreon page uh, you can also go to patreon.com and yeah. find us there you just type in rook media if you're familiar with patreon which is um, one of the ways that a lot of podcasts and uh, digital media entities uh, are uh, collect their sort of crowdfunding, crowdsourcing is through Patreon. Um, we uh, are on a new mission to shout out the names of, uh, yes. of people when they join on to Patreon. Uh, so we'll do at least one or two each show. So today I want to shout out uh, a gentleman named Farid Qasim Assad. Farid Qasim Assad, who is a new bronze member on our Patreon page. Thank you, Farid. Um, thanks to everybody else who are Patreon members. Now that we're into March, the first Patreon newsletter will be coming out. <laughs> really don't know how exciting that is, <laughs> the free, but you will be receiving right. your first uh, newsletter to our Patreon members uh, with some swank photos. That's how about right. that? And and share some feedback. Let us know your thoughts. I mean, the the whole idea of getting on Patreon was so that we can engage, and and we'd love to hear from you. Yes. Uh, thank you again to people who are our Patreon members. If you're not already, rookmedia.com, support us button. All right. Thank you, Pega. Thank you. Good to have you back. Our first guest today is an Iranian economist based in Vienna, Dr. Mahdi Godsi. 
is an economist at the Vienna Institute for International Economic Studies and an adjunct professor of economics at the Vienna University of Economics and Business. He obtained his master's and doctorate in international economics from the University of Warsaw and a second PhD from the Catholic University of Milan. His research focuses on international trade, foreign direct investment, global value chains, environmental technologies and innovation, political economy of sanctions, and the Iran economy. He's also a member of the editorial board of International Economics. And right now, Dr. Mahdi Grudzi joins me from Vienna, Austria today. Hello, sir. Hello. Thank you for your nice introduction. It's a great pleasure to have you on, partly because, um, well, uh, certainly because you've been writing, talking about, thinking about uh, these issues around the Iranian economy in recent years, but particularly since the uprising has has begun, it's something that uh, people are focusing on around the world. But also because uh, we dance around this subject of the Iranian economy a lot on this show, um, particularly vis-a-vis the stability of this regime and the non-stability at present. And uh, it's good to have somebody who actually um, deals with this stuff to to help clarify or give us a, some some concrete ideas of what we're dealing with with the Iranian economy today. So thank you for doing this. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, Matty, let me start with a very uh, basic question. How would you describe the Iranian economy today? Well, Iranian economy today, actually, where we stand right now, it's uh, in a deep crisis. Uh, I call it crisis despite the fact, despite the uh, issues that the head of the government and other ministers and other um, authorities in Iran are claiming because uh, they're showing some statistics that they would like to say, but the real statistics that are provided by the um, Center of Statistics of Iran and more recently the uh, Central Bank of Iran are showing a different picture. It's actually a dark picture in the Iranian economy because Iran has never encountered such huge uh, increase in prices of good and primary commodities that uh, any consumer needs uh, in in this country. So it's not only about inflation, it's about an economy that is a major part of it, maybe around 70 to 90 percent by some estimates of myself. Uh, It's owned by the public economy, it's owned by the government or it's owned by the semi-public companies. So let's say about 10 to 20 percent is only private sector and the rest of it is public economy. So this 70, 80 percent is not the thing that it was uh, four decades ago. So four decades ago, um, at the start of this Islamic uh, Republic, the, the, the major uh, public economy was about 10, 20 percent because it was just the side of the government and the government expenditure. But gradually, public companies like the oil company that we know is the largest one in Iran, they got bigger and bigger. So within uh, big um, public economy, it's difficult to forecast. It's difficult to predict the rationality behind the behavior of uh, rational agents of economy. This political system has always managed to control the society with the force or with terror or with similar repression, but it cannot do the same for economics. Let me stop you, and uh, there's a few things that you've said there that I want to sort of excavate one by one, but uh, first of all, the economy, the Iranian economy, has there's a lot of words that have been used to describe it. If you Google Iranian economy in the latest news uh, um, clips that come up, words like crisis that you used or catastrophe or disaster come up. Um, you've also recently called it a dark comedy. It's an interesting term because it suggests to me a crisis is something that can happen based on external factors. Dark comedy suggests that the issues are rooted as well in uh, some kind of bumbling mismanagement, not just, say, the effects of sanctions. What what do you see as an example of how the regime has fumbled the ball? Well, it starts, actually, this dark comedy started 
maybe 11 years ago when when the sanctions hit the country and Ahmadinejad at that time he said uh, we don't see any impact of sanctions but it was gradually after that one year after two years after that we saw the real effect was coming the government was incapable of uh, financing its own uh, ribbon its own budget then gradually it was Rouhani's era so Rouhani was trying to somehow make friendship with the West but due to some circumstances that I can explain later if there's time um, it didn't happen it it was it wasn't successful mm. then in in about two years ago um, the establishment the political establishment in Iran thought that they could uh, get hold of the situation and foster economy uh, if they become completely un uniform. And that's how they try to uh, engineer the election and propose mainly um, hardline candidates as the uh, presidents. So since then, since, since Raisi is the um, head of the government, uh, we don't observe any expertise in the government. So if if you check their um, PhD thesis, you would see that they were uh, studying economic issues related to uh, charity and Islam, rather than real sciences in economics that we study in any kind of university, even in Iran. So they were used in the cabinet and they were advising policies. The, the worst thing that happened was a momentum uh, that shook the prices in the beginning of summer by um, removing the preferential exchange rate. So Raisi removed this exchange rate and suddenly the prices erupted tremendously by 100%, by 200%. And that was a momentum that um, shook the inflation. So despite the data that we were observing from the uh, Central of Statistics, the officials, Raisi's team, they were arguing, no, the inflation is lower. So that was that that was the comedy that I was referring right, to. Right. So some people were doing it, but they didn't know what they are doing. And that's a comedy, but it's a dark comedy because it affects people's lives and welfare. How Give us a, a sense of the scale of how it affects people's lives and welfare. You talked in that first answer, you were just saying, um, that, you, I mean, you, you seem to be intimating that this is unprecedented. You know, for as long as I can remember, or at least in recent years, my family, for example, inside Iran and, and outside of, of all, always talk about how horrible the Iranian economy is. And, and we know that national economies go through boom and bust periods. How does the moment we're in with Iran right now compare to its best and worst days in recent decades? Well, according to the official statistics three years ago, the rate of poverty in Iran stood at 33%. So then 33% of the population was under poverty, absolute poverty. And this figure a decade ago was less than 20% what this, uh, from the same source. So since three years ago, because of this huge inflation that we were experiencing, and because income of the people, income of the um, employees of the government, employees of uh, la labor force, uh, their salaries did not increase as much as inflation. And in order to show you the the, the, the large picture, it's only 27% of the population that are working. The rest are jobless or either in the uh, as, as pensioners. So think about it that around three years ago, this inflation increased and their income didn't increase and many people became jobless. So what we could say right now, what we could estimate is about 50% of the population is under poverty and that is no joke. No. So people are li living there, people are uh, facing such um, poverty. But one, have to, one has to be cautious that the other 50% of the society, they don't see it. So. There are many affluent people from different professions that earn maybe uh, 10 times of my salary in Austria. So these people, I'm not saying they are uh, they're stealing from the other 50 percent, but I'm saying this inequality is right now into a uh, situation that maybe the other half 
will uh, uprise against the other, the, the affluent. How do you sustain a country with fifty uh, percent of the country under uh, under the pop? It's, it seems like a prescription for disaster if we don't already know that. Can Can I ask you? To uh, and I'll for, I hope the audience will forgive me for asking what is probably a really naive question. But for those of us who need this explained, if you can do it in a very simple terms, why is the Iranian real collapsing against the U.S. dollar, which we hear about all the time? Why is that so problematic for average Iranians? So. Um if we want to understand why price of certain commodity or certain asset goes up and down, it's related to its demand side. So whenever demand of certain commodity or asset increases, then we expect that its price also increases. So in the Iranian society nowadays, because of instability, because of political instability, and because of high large amount of inflation, 50%, 60%, and because people cannot save their money in the banks because the banks can offer mainly 20, 25% annually. So they lose their money if they put their the money in the bank. So in order to invest, they buy gold, they buy foreign currency because that's the only thing that can save the value of it. So the demand for it is going up, but from the side of the government, the government does not have enough reserves to uh, supply it sufficiently so that the price is stabilized and price doesn't change. So one trigger that we observe was inflation. So inflation is feeding the um, one side of it so that people demand more of foreign currencies. The other side is political instability, that people are afraid of losing um, their income, their wealth, if there is a revolution, nobody knows what happens after that, so they are trying to save whatever they can. Right. So the demand side is huge, so that's why the currency goes up. But what happens if currency goes up? Iran is uh, not self-sufficient in many, many, many sectors and many, many products. So it's importing lots of food, lots of livestock feed, lots of technologically advanced products like computers, iPhones, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if um dollar the value of dollar increases against real then imports of those products would become more expensive so think about it as a vicious circle right. the higher prices prices domestically lead to more demand of foreign currency and then from that prices would increase right so right. it's difficult to sustain it i got you thank you for that uh, now there's also some confusing information that comes out of iran because on the one hand we hear crisis, um, severe inflation, 50% uh, of the population under the poverty line. At the same time, I was reading that analysts are saying Tehran has increased oil exports. This is the Islamic Republic has increased oil exports to more than 1.2 million barrels a day over the, last, over the past three months. So this would suggest the IRI is finding ways around sanctions and business as usual, would it not? That's true. So the increase in sale of oil or export of oil started since Biden took office. So before that, um, the U.S. administration was very hawkish on Iran selling oil. So it would it would have punished any country that was buying it, including China and India. Since Biden administration, which was uh, overlapping with the last few months of Rouhani's administration, um, Iran was managing to again uh, reestablish the export routes to China, India, and many other countries, including um, countries in the region. So that's how the production increased, the exports increased. But as you mentioned, it's up to a ceiling level, which is 1.2 to 1.5 million barrels per day. It is something big, but we, we, we observed even bigger, larger amounts 10 years ago by 2.5 million barrels per day. So. Many countries now, because uh, U.S. administration is trying to push further pressure on Iran, is asking countries like India to not buy oil from Iran. But at the same time, because of um, Russian war of aggression on Ukraine, um, the choice, uh, the choices of suppliers is very limited. So U.S. and its allies asked these countries to buy, to purchase 
oil from Russia with about 20-25% discount in order to not allow Russia to enjoy revenues. So in order for Iran to export its oil, it needs to give even a higher, much higher discount mm. over Russian exports. So Iran is exporting one and a half million barrels per day, uh, per, uh, per day, but its total revenue is, let's say, more than 25% lower than should be in reality. Where is that oil going to? Is it China? Most of it is China. Right. And you believe that the U.S. could have some dominion over stopping this if it if it pushed China hard enough? Of course it can, but maybe it's not reached that level to push China to stay away from Iranian oil. So it could be similar. It could be a similar case as we experienced at the time of Trump, but it's not there yet. So, Dr. Gutsi, this 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 revenue comes in still some revenue, the oil revenue, uh, to Iran. But you've written about the fact that despite the economic crisis in Iran, the regime continues to pour money into what you call the Islamic Republic Trinity. Um, and this is a, a troika of, of areas that they, they're putting the money into. One is the IRGC, another is state broadcasting, the third is religious organizations. Uh, what is the economic plan around these actions? So this started since Raisi took office. So it was mandated in the budget that they submitted to the parliament. So the inflation uh, at the time when they were submitting this uh, this year budget, which was about a year ago, the inflation was expected to be around 40 to 50 percent, which we observed that it is 50 percent. So one would have expected that they would increase also the salary of people who are working for the government by that 40 to 50 percent. But because but because they didn't have the money to pay for that, they didn't increase that by that much. They increased it only by 10 percent. But because they they were expecting a kind of discontent coming from the people who are losing their real income to go on the streets, they were expecting that they increased the salaries and uh, let's say the budget of those trinities. So those are the, the things that we observed this year, this Persian calendar year that um, because of those discontents, because of a shock that uh, uh, propagated to Iran's society, which was by the killing of Mahsa Amini, this shock took people to the street. And as, as we observed, the intelligence service, the IRGC, and many of those people who are in those trinities getting funding, they were ready to suppress easily. So the same thing happens also this year for the next Persian calendar year. They don't intend to increase the salaries as much as they expected inflation, but they increase the budget of this trinity more than that. I mean, the the IRGC funding, I'm I'm guessing... I mean, it's not rocket science. I'm guessing this is to 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 facilitate and fuel the crackdown to to ensure some kind of security of the regime. Is that the idea? That's true. That's 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 the that's what I call economics of suppression. So, uh, at the time of crisis, economic crisis, um, or let's say at the time of war. Uh, the economic situation, the economic planning of countries get different. So if you see also in Russia, there could be also a different strategy now compared to two years ago when it was not at war. So a country is trying to be prepared for whatever happens. So that's why it is um, giving more resources to sustain its uh, survival rather than to appease the population and increase the welfare of the society. And that's what we observe in Iran and also in Russia. So if you were um, advising the Islamic Republic as an economist, would it make sense to be pouring money into religious organizations and the IRGC? Well, <laughs> that's what they're doing. What I could suggest to the Islamic Republic is to listen to the population demand. They are demanding for change. They are demanding, they are, they are fed up for uh, consecutive years being targeted by sanctions. Economically, they do not like the situation anymore. And in terms of society, they are fed up with it. They don't want uh, a leviathan that can kick them all the time to 
tell them what to wear, what to do. They want liberty. They want freedom. They want to develop their ideas. They want to develop their way of living. Sure. So that's that's the thing that I can suggest is first give um, what the society demands, not what you like, and second turn back to the friendship with with the world and with whoever is leading the economy in the world and uh, get rid of the sanctions. So on that note, um, how much do you believe the regime is banking on the resuscitation of the JCPOA? Well, in the past few weeks, we observed that Iranian officials are trying heavily to revive the deal. They understand the misfortunate that came with the uh, with uh, sanctions, with, with the maximum pressure campaign. Now they are observing it. Now they are feeling it. Now they are afraid that the political system changes and they are demanding the Western society. The, so you, 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 observe, you observed it with um, Abdullah Yan having trips to Europe. And this is not only limited to officials. This is also observed with the expertise, with, with experts that are lining themselves with the political system, that they are showing a picture that if you do not return to the JCPOA, Iran will hog, Iran will uh, get closer and closer to China and Russia, and the Eastern Bloc will become uh, more powerful. Therefore, you should avoid that, you should come to a deal, and you should come back to the negotiating table. But West observe it now differently. West senses that uh, there is a very high probability that in the very near future, less than three to five years, the political system in Iran changes because there is, uh, it is inevitable. This political system will change, and making any deal with the current political system would jeopardize the next political system, whatever that looked like. Well, there's also... Um, many people, I would say, the vast majority of uh, Iranians in the diaspora, uh, let alone others, um, who uh, and within Iran, who don't want um, the West to engage in any kind of deal anymore or any kind of engagement with this uh, this regime. Uh, but if we remove the political elements, if we remove our our what we wish for and what we want, etc. Um, is it true that if that that the, a deal like the JCPOA um, would stabilize this regime? I mean, is that is it as simple as that? It is a sign of that. Yes, it is as simple as that. Or we can say, the we can think about the counterfactual, which is the status quo. The counterfactual is that there is no JCPOA, there is a huge economic pressure on the shoulder of Iranian society, but there is also political instability within. Um, it's it's at the end, it is the society, it is the Iranians, it is from within that change should come. Mm. So some people argue that um, the, the civil society will become empowered if they are affluent, if they have welfare, if they can uh, live a good life, then they can think about their freedom. But there could be also the other side of the spectrum that nothing works perfectly and people are fed up and then they go to the streets, not 100, not 1,000, but millions. Yes. So that they can finally say their words. Yes. I think the latter is where most people are at in their thinking uh, um, th th these days, uh, we, hence the unity of most of the um, Iranian community around the world. I wanted to mention something. I feel like I'd be, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it, given that yesterday was International Women's Day. I was reading a statistic you retweeted yesterday, which which just floored me, that only one in nine women over the age of 15 are currently employed in Iran. That, I mean, that's unbelievable. I mean, you know, when we talk about... Um, gender apartheid I, I feel like we're usually referring to rules and regulations like forced hijab or basic rights etc this stat suggests that the disparities along gender lines are are work related as well are economic yes that is true 
So although the population of the educated society, the, the, there is not much gap between men and women, but for the economic perspective, there is a huge gap. So let's say about uh, 60-70% of the men are in the labor force and they can find jobs. But for women, it's only 20%, uh, which tells us why in Iran, only 27% of the population is working. So the rest of 75%, the rest of 72%, to be precise, that is not working, majority of it is female. So this is not the case for Turkey. And uh, Turkey is also, again, an Islamic country. But they have different kinds of uh, attitude toward women. They Women are not forced to wear hijab in Turkey. So this different attitude helped Turkey to have a much more larger rate of participation of women in the in the economy. So in Iran, maybe this statistic is coming from the official statistics that uh, is considered considering women who are paying their insurance, women who are paying their taxes. So there could be many cases that women are working, but they are not officially in, a, in the statistics. Underground economy kind of way. Yes. I, I mean, the absurdity of it as well is that doesn't the wasn't one of the things that the Islamic Republic likes to trumpet is that a greater percentage or proportion of women have been going to school and and university in, in recent decades. So um, which you kind of think, OK, well, if that's true, then what are they going to university for if they're not allowed to work or if they're not able to find places in the in the current economy? Well, uh, that is true. So uh, it's a big endeavor and it's a big struggle of Iranian women that they want to show themselves, they want to prove themselves, they want to achieve different things on their own, they, they want to be independent, but at the end they cannot. So think about little things in law that does not give the same rights to women, they cannot um, go abroad without the permission of the husband. So this pushes even further uh, discrimination against women that anything that the husband says they should abide and if the husband says you do, you do not go to work she will not go to work she should not go to work so these kinds of discrimination is rooted within the system so the only savior of such kind of society that is discriminating against women is that from from top to the bottom there there should be new yeah. regulations yeah. there should be new law there should be uh, motivation and incentives by the government in order to decrease this discrimination. These are the things that we observe in advanced economies like the European ones or American ones. So the governments are trying to regulate it and reduce the discrimination as much as they can. And they're successful. But when we, when we talk about one in nine uh, women being employed, um, and presumably there are about 50% of the, the population or, or so, or maybe more, um, it, it's a disaster. I mean, it's just that, you know, you've got an entire cohorts of, of generations who are not able, who are not working, I guess. Um, hence your, you know, the 50% under the poverty line that the, the cycle that continues. Let me, um, I'm so grateful for, for you to, for your insights today. Thank you for doing this. Let me end with a couple of questions. And if you can maybe take off your professor hat and put on your, um, uh, I don't know, uh, opinion, opinion cap. Don't, uh, you, I won't hold you to it forever. Uh, uh, how much of a liability do you believe this economic catastrophe in Iran is to the regime in terms of it being a contribution to revolution and the overthrow of the Islamic Republic? Well, a person who doesn't have anything to eat, a person who doesn't live, a person who is under pure and absolute poverty, um, put yourself in, in the head of that kind of person. That person, if it is me, I have nothing else to lose. So I, I go and stand in front of the bullet because I want to end this miserable life so I will do whatever to change this status quo if it is from the uh, regime, if it is from other people in the society. 
many countries, as, as we observed in, in the past, many countries like India, like China, they saw this big liability that you mentioned, and they tried to open up, they tried to develop, they tried to be friends with the West and the US, and now they're developed. Now they're even um, less po less poor, and they they have a great role in global economy. All right. So a final question on that. No, you've said, let me quote you, uh, not dissimilar to what you just said. The only solution for Iran's economic misery is to change the political system in Iran, which will depend very much on the opposition leaders depicting depicting a bright blueprint for a phase into secular democracy. Have we seen anything like that blueprint yet? Not yet. There is, there is supposed to be, I, I, I haven't, I haven't uh, seen actually this resolution that they want to um, prepare. So I hope this resolution that they are calling as resolution could be the blueprint that we think. And um, I think they are gathering their forces very well. They take their time, so they are waiting for the right moment. They are in contact, as they mentioned a lot, they're in contact with the opposition leaders from within, from within prisons. So whatever they're trying to do, I hope it's something that brings finally secular democracy, because otherwise we will see the same thing even in less than four decades, that people will struggle for having a secular democracy. Dr. Mahdi Godsi, uh, it's such a pleasure to talk to you. Um, thank you. I hope we get a chance to do it again. I really appreciate the time today. Merci. Thank you very much, Jan. It was a pleasure to talk to you. Khodafes. This dream I'm dreaming Won't you wake me up tonight Cause this life I'm living Doesn't really feel like mine. This strange dream This is Rook, episode 245, The Iranian Economy is a Dark Comedy. All right, we're back here in the Rook studio, and my next guest has walked into the Rook studio and is set up here. He is an Iranian-Canadian Kamanche player, a composer, a music instructor, and a performer of classical and traditional music, and I'm so excited to have him here with his instrument in the studio, Kurosh Babai started his first violin lessons at the age of 12, then took an interest in playing the Kamonche. He was under the supervision of the prominent Iranian maestro Ardashir Kamkar. He has performed all over the world and has worked with some of the most well-known Iranian musicians, such as Christophe Rezaei, Reza Rouhani, Shahram Nazeri, Mojgan Shajarian, Ali Reza Qurbani, Hushang Zarif, and Ali Reza Eftekhari. Kurosh moved to Toronto, Canada in 2016 and continues to teach music and perform in concerts around the world. And right now, Kurosh Babai joins me here in the Rook studio. Hello, sir. Hello, how are you? Thanks for having me here. What a great pleasure it is to have you here. I, uh, it's been a long time coming, and it's uh, really nice to have you here. And even nicer because I see you've brought your little, um, your uh, partner in crime, your 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 love object. I mean, what yeah. do we call it? Uh, girlfriend. Your girlfriend. <laughs> I see. <laughs> your Kamonche is here. Um, it, it, you are a wizard on that instrument, and you're a kid from Abadan. Um, uh, do you remember your first time encountering a Kamonche? Yeah. Actually, my story started when I was 10, 11 years old, and I went to a party with my uncle and my family, and I saw someone was playing violin. You know, I hypnotized when I saw him, and I shocked because I never seen before someone playing uh, instrument in person. But that was a violin. Yeah, it was violin. Okay. Yeah, I started with violin. So my uncle was seven years older than me and he could buy a violin for himself. 
and uh, <laughs> I was younger I couldn't ask my parent to get one for me and a day I remember I went to my grandma's home uh, I saw the violin hanged on the wall and I carefully picked it up and I started to play something and I uh, to how to put my finger on mm-hmm. fingerboard and mm-hmm. make a sound and my mom, grandma rushed to the room oh don't be careful do not damage your uncle's instrument uh, but she surprised because I could make some melodies that is interesting for her and it was it right away yeah it was interesting a true calling <laughs> yeah, yeah. And after that, I just insist my parents to, I need to get one. I need to play something. You know, the, at that age, the Iran's uh, situation wasn't very good. Uh, uh, right after uh, Iran and Iraq wars. Uh-huh. Um, so this is the late yeah. 80s or yeah, 90s. The yeah, early, early 80s. But my mother sold a piece of gold to, to get that instrument for me. You know, there wasn't even... Um, any music store to buy an instrument for yourself. Where are you at this point? Oh, this is Hamadan? Yeah. This is Hamadan. Right one year before war, we moved to Hamadan. Hmm. We were lucky because, you know, the Khuzestan was the, the most damaged. My dad being from Abadan as well. Really? Yeah, yes. Oh, I didn't know you were a fellow Khuzestani uh, oh, uh, kid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Until well, now, yeah. Well, like <laughs> <laughs> so I moved to Hamadan, yeah. I mm, grown up there and uh, yeah, I, I figure out someone want to sell a violin, and I insist my mother to just get that one for me. I remember uh, she bought that instrument by seven thousand to month. I believe this is ten, fifteen cents right now. But at that time, it was a big amount for our right. family. So I started to self thought and self study by myself because wow. even we didn't have any teacher in Hamadan. So but I, she really trusted or believed that you had a gift for this. Yeah, I mean, exactly, that's a yeah, exactly. that's a remarkable turn in your life history. Like if your mom <laughs> doesn't buy the the violin for you, you don't end up being exactly who you become, right? So the mom is very important, but uh, people that uh, was in my way was. Uh, important uh, of course um, for example a guy uh, after a few uh, months that I'm trying to to learn how to figure out how to play and I uh, saw someone in uh, Hamidan Zershad's uh, office he was the band leader for Hamidan band his name was Masoud Feriduni. He died recently. Uh, uh, he just introduced me Kamanche and he lent me a Kamanche to practice whatever learned in violin mm-hmm. because he wanted to keep me an, in a group, but with the uh, Kamanche sound. The, the tune of Kamanche is different, of, you know. The taste is more Persian, taste mm-hmm. is more. Uh, I was going to ask you how transferable are the skills? Say if you're a very. Uh, accomplished violin player, mm-hmm. would you be able to pick pick up the camonche and make yeah. sounds out of it? Yeah. Of course. You know, the intervals and the fingerboard all almost the same, but the, we did different direction. Mm-hmm. The More board. so related than the, the cello, say? Uh, because the cello yeah. looks more like the camel yeah, chair, so in, put it between your legs and you. No, the difference is the interval in cellos is is larger. Uh-huh. So I mean, each tones is like uh, about ten centimeter, for right, example. But right. in camel is exactly the same as violin. About each tone is uh, three centimeter, and half tone is just close to okay. it. Okay. So um, it's easy. It was easy for me to switch uh, to camel chair. Um So. The, you know the atmosphere in Iran wasn't that much good. You know at that time even there was committee. They searched the cars to find something. Even the cassette. There was literally in those early the first that first decade of Islamic Republic. Yeah. There was there was no music. No music. I mean music, it was yeah, let alone course. classical. There was nothing. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So you're almost doing something even by playing the violin. You're doing something subversive. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, let alone being in a rock band. Right. Yeah. yeah. So fortunately, the style that I am uh, interested in was traditional. So for the for Islamic Republic, traditional 
how do I explain it? It's be khatar tar with barosh. You know, it's not as dangerous. Yeah, somehow, dangerous right? like the rock and pop, uh, pop right, and right. the other or metal. Right. So it's, they didn't. Uh, it wasn't forbidden. Yeah, exactly. So uh, on Fash Festival, do they now? Has that changed? The support for mm, they support more pop music, I believe. Uh-huh. After uh, maybe ten, maybe twenty years after the revolution, they support more pop music because they understood they can earn money from that uh-huh. side. Right, yeah. right. Uh, so we went to Fash Festival. We took the first place in in band playing on on that uh, festival. So mm-hmm. the government sent us out of Iran for the concert to China and North Korea. Wow. Yeah. North Korea? Yeah. North you Korea. played in North Korea? Exactly. Oh my God. Yeah, this is interesting. I know. <laughs> but it was his name was Kim Il-sung and his birthday was a, was a big, great festival in Pyongyang. Oh wow. And we went there, yeah. We did a very fancy hotel. And, and you're a teenager? How old are you at that of point? Of course, uh, 17, I think. So you've gotten good, quite Quickly, you'd gotten exactly. really good at this. Yeah, really. And are you still playing? Are you playing Kamon Chen? Yeah, no, okay. I'm playing Kamon. So you're doing like a traditional Iranian music in North Korea. <laughs> <laughs> it oh, was that, a, what an experience! So it wasn't only the Persians band. Um, all around the world, uh, even the dancers and magicians, and the Lord, there's, there was a lot of uh, different band uh, played on that festival. So this is uh, my first experience to playing. Uh, uh, music out of Iran. Mm. So after that, I moved to Tehran because he, uh, Hamidam was uh, wasn't that much sure. large for yeah. me to to, yeah. to get improved. So I visit, uh, as you said, Ardishir Konkar. He was uh, he was my teacher. After a while, uh, I mean, after six seven months, he just offered me to join the very very famous band in Iran. Uh, with uh, uh, with band leader Parviz Mishkatyan, uh, the, the the band is um, Araf band, and it was amazing for me because I I I even dream about this time. Mm. You know, I, when I was very young, I just bought uh, the first album from uh, this guy. It was B Dot uh, with Master Mamar um, Zashajarian. Uh, it was great for me to to even. Uh, see him from wow. uh, in person. It okay, was, now yeah. let me ask you something. Yeah. How does a guy who becomes this proficient, this talented, this well known, even what you're describing right now? You're at the Fudge Festival. You're joining this famous band. You go and play in China and in North Korea, etc. Uh, it's so curious to me that you end up going into graphic design. Oh yeah, I will because tell you. you so you end up at the the University of Art and Architecture in Tehran, and you end up being a graphic designer. Yeah, okay. and I I understand why people obviously if you're you know um, a rock musician or uh, somebody playing jazz or something like that, you're you're aware of the limitations of a music career in Iran. So mm-hmm. you end up going into becoming an engineer. I mean, we've heard this story over and over again. All these great talents who felt like they had to get a medical degree or something like that to, uh, because it's not possible. But, w- but when you're playing the kind of music that you're playing, mm-hmm. traditional Iranian music, and you're as good as you are, as young as you are. Why would you feel the incentive to go and have a, have another uh, career? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, I wasn't uh, satisfied with uh, earning money with you know, teaching kamanche and and playing in a band. So um, I always earn money from graphic and spend money for music. At, so at that are you age. saying even if you're a star no. at the kamanche? You can't be have a lucrative of, career in. Uh, of course, you can because there is a lot of people who lives on on only music. But I wanted to be a little bit more uh, independent, uh, you know. Uh, so um, I established my own company with a lot of employer and a lot of uh, colleague. I, I had many, many different and very high level of uh, clients. I know field. you play. Were you playing music yeah. all at the same time? And yeah, at the same time. But of for sure, uh, when you have a professional job, you cannot divide it in in equal. Um, so, so first of all, you know, when I read the list of, I didn't even, 
I stopped. I, I cut out some of the name with the list of people you've worked with. Oh, yeah. It's basically, I mean, I don't even, I don't know who's left. I mean, I, these are all the names I know, you know, in terms of big names in the, in Iranian classical music, I guess you'd call it. Mm. Um, how did you become, um, and don't be uh here. I mean, mm. you tell us, tell us, you know, how, how did you become the go-to person for Kamon Che? I mean, it, it seems like, to read the the roster of people you've worked with, it seems like anybody who's ever wanted a Cavalier player would would ask you. Is is that true? Uh, maybe I was lucky because you know at the, the age that I started, uh, there wasn't this much players. After revolution, you know, th- there wasn't anywhere to to uh, t- to show yourself. The, many right. of those right. artists just left their job. Of so course. I was alone. <laughs> And I easily could get their job, you know. Uh, so uh, I believe I was lucky to 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 be on the way of these artists. Mm. Yeah, this is my opinion. Um, do, does any does I mean just while we're at it, uh, I've seen you performing even with a few with Shahram Nazari with a, a number of different artists. Was there somebody early on that you performed with where you had that a moment of oh my god I can't believe that. I'm actually on stage with this person. Can you think back to who that, a a sort of milestone for you in terms of performing with anybody in particular? Uh, When you're younger, you're more uh, interested in to see artists and to work with them. And when you get age, it's easier for you to, because you have a lot of experience. But I, I remember the first day that I've seen uh, Mr. Farom Aspaibar and I was shaking because you know this guy was uh, one of really one of the greatest artists in Iran with 50 or 55 I don't know 60 books that he wrote before that I, I just saw Mr. Parviz Mishkatian and yes it was amazing for me to to be with them and to to learn from them you know, I always uh, it was a master class to be mm. with the, with this band yeah um, you're gonna play something for us I'm gonna pause the interview for a second mm-hmm. while um, and I'm really excited about this because we had an event I had mentioned it on the show a couple of weeks ago that we did an event in Toronto a Rook Media events and you came and played and um, before you played, I said, oh, what are you going to play? He said, I don't know, I'll just do some improvisation, <laughs> which which turned into this incredible, um, I mean, uh, I don't know, eight, ten minutes that you were playing. And I, I told you this afterwards, I feel almost a bit um, embarrassed that I don't know the instrument better because I've seen so many people, including you, play it. But you really opened my mind even more about the Camonche watching you play that day because I felt like um, I've always seen it as a particularly um, maybe not a limited but a but a, an instrument that has its function uh, to sort of play a melody line or something like that but the way you can get this thing to talk it feels like it's the possibilities are endless. Are, are you going to play something like that for us? <laughs> Can you just play what you played the other day? Of course, I will try. Um, the piece that I played for you uh, in your event was, uh, it's it called uh, Eastern Memory. Um, oh, it wasn't an improvisation. No, a part uh, see, of See, I thought it, you were just yeah, making yeah. that shit up. Look I at will you. Tell you. I will tell you. <laughs> yeah. I started with improvisation uh-huh. but and then connected to that piece uh, uh-huh. because... Uh, I thought this piece is um, is is more extra attractive because it has many different uh, material on it. I can just start playing improvise for one hour. It doesn't matter if for me. Right, if you want, right. if you, I can do that. Right. But uh, I prefer to to play something uh, that I've I thought about that. I sure. think it's more sure. interesting. But right now, it's as you wish. On what kind of music? Do well, you want I to hear? that what, if you, what, what's it called? Eastern what? East, uh, Eastern e- memory. Eastern memory. Yeah. Why don't you play that? <laughs> okay, I will do that. <laughs> so I will play, and after that, I want to introduce this instrument because this is not the regular camanche. Oh, yeah. But let me play something sure. after that. Sure. Sure. All right. All okay. right. Uh, so you go, let's see. You, you go get set up okay. here. We'll. I know we have to adjust a couple of things. This is Kurosh Babai uh, playing his well a different kind of camouflage. He's yeah. going to tell us about that after he performs. He's just getting set up here. This is Kurosh Babai in the Rook Studio.
live in the Rook studio. That's <laughs> Kurosha Babai. Wow. Thank you. That's fantastic. Now, tell me, first of all, mm-hmm. um, you said that that's not a traditional Camon chair. Um, what is the difference? What, what, what are we looking at here? Okay. Um, this piece uh, is a masterpiece by Mr. Uh, Peter Biffin, who lives in Australia. He's a researcher and one of the master in uh, music uh, instrument maker. He just developed a structure of Kamanche. For Kamanche, we need animal skin in front of the bow, so it transferred f- uh, sounds from string to, to the bridge and from the bridge to the skin and then goes to the resonance box. Mm-hmm. Something is special in this instrument because it has seven different sympathetic strings it goes inside the neck the it sound. almost sounds like a sustain pedal or something exactly i was sound. wondering how yeah, that was it's happening very nice, yeah. wow yeah for for regular chemistry you need to amplify you need to have a uh, effect on your on the way of the uh, auxiliary for this instrument you do really do not need anything because the sound that comes out has an effect on it what what is the most challenging part of learning to play camonche i mean compared to say violin or most <laughs> string instruments you know it depends on um, your talent is and the time that you spend for to learning but if you want to uh, know about the specific uh, thing i believe this instrument you need to rotate the instrument to play in different strings oh wow so this is make this instrument a little bit harder and, uh, so you're so it's not the bow that's going all around it's you're no. moving the instrument exactly. while you're bowing exactly yeah. um of course i know you that you teach a lot yeah. um who are the people who are interested in learning Kamonche now i mean are they are they in Iran or are they outside of Iran and, and who do they tend to be? What do, What is the attraction for Kamanche so at this stage? I have many students from different places, uh, even from Ukraine, from from different area, Russia. Non-Iranians? Uh, Non-Iranians oh. even, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Mr. Kehan Kalhor mm-hmm. uh, introduced this instrument very good to the to, to board, you know. Uh, people now, they can collaborate with this instrument with different uh, taste of music. I mean, what you were just playing there, especially at the end of it, if you amplified it, if you put some electronics in that and put it through an amp, <laughs> it would sound like an electric guitar. Yeah, right? I, it can do that, yeah. I have to ask you, um, uh, going back to when you were in Iran, then I'm going to ask you about coming here, but um, you were not, You were also in a, in a band called Rumi with Hamid Nikpei. Yeah, exactly. What yeah. was what was it like to play with a young uh, Hamid Nikpei? Yeah, yeah I, I, I remember many different memories uh, with him. Um, we started to to, uh, to uh, with a band with called Rumi with uh, Pedro Amderakhshani. He was very very uh, talented in music. He he brought a kind of fusion music in that time that we didn't have before. Uh, he mixed Kamanche, Santur, Tar with the bass guitar, drums, and keyboard, and many different uh, material. And the instrument, the Persian instrument, just uh, colored that uh, mm. that kind of music. It, it was amazing. And I remember first time when I saw uh, when I visited uh, Hamid Nikli. It was very young. It was very. Uh, terrified of the band because we were we were old older than him yeah and he was shaking and i said why are you shaking <laughs> i was teasing him you've worked with a lot of gifted vocalists yeah you yeah, know yeah. shaharm nazari hamad these these are these are the best we have and it's uh <laughs> it must be um so wonderful to have this uh this experience with so many of them uh tell me about the move to canada because uh, for, by all indications you were doing really well in Iran, socially, uh, professionally, financially. Why, why did you end up wanting to, to leave Iran in 2016? Um, it, it's uh, back to Hezaros um, Isada Hashtadash after voting to, yeah, 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 the Green Movement. So I saw, you know, um, let me back to that time that time that I was in Iran when I uh, attending to the voting and, and different uh, type of uh, movement. Um, always my friend out of Iran just 
um, I, I remember on Facebook at that, that time, they wrote, they wrote for us, do not attending to voting, do, do protest, go to the street. And I always ask them, please leave this issue for ourselves because we live in this country. We know that the, all the society knows where, where it goes. Yeah. And at that time, I thought we can change something little by little. But, but we mistake, you know, we couldn't change anything. After that, I saw the votes are disappeared and everything changed. And I saw I cannot make any changes for this country. And I decided for my family and my young daughter to give them freedom. So for her future, I, uh, you know, when I came here, I was 45. It's, it's old for, for movement, for this kind of movement. Mm -hmm. But I decided to do that. Or Well, you know, it's... What's interesting is we often hear the story mm -hmm. of people, as you know, having to leave Iran, especially in the arts, you know, because they couldn't make a living in Iran. I mean, a dancer or a, a rock musician yeah. or um, and then all kinds of other reasons people have to leave mm -hmm. to become refugees. Maybe they're Baha'i or they're gay or, you know. Um, and then we hear about people who are in economic tough situations so they have to leave or people who are young and want to come here and study. It's interesting to hear from someone who uh, has a lot to lose. I mean, you're not, you're not uh, alone. Uh, we, of course, know the stories of great doctors who've come here and end up driving a cab or something, you know. But, but you, you're not someone who... Um, necessarily had the promise of a materially better life by coming to Canada. Exactly. Um, so it's a pretty profound decision to make to say, you know, um, despite the fact that we're doing well in Iran, I'm going to pick up and move the family to Canada. It really speaks to that country being unattractive for for a, after a certain point for someone to want want to leave th that badly someone who's connected musically to that exactly. country and culture mm -hmm. you know what um, always at that time when i wanted to move here i mean to 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 immigrant here they they always told me, why are you leaving? You're, you be a senior, but you always been invited in uh, different events for the first row in, the, in every uh, events. Uh, but, and you, you, you have your money, you can earn, as you said, uh, we had uh, many things. But, you know, I thought, um, when I'm thinking right now, our daughters, our children and, and the schools are poison that I'm right now I will be happy that I took my daughter yeah, out yeah. but always I, I, I'm you know uh, I'm unhappy with what happened in Iran uh, but at least you know uh, we're spending our life uh, we need to have a Zendigi Mamuli you know mm. we need to have a regular uh, life for, uh, for ourselves uh, so I decided to move. Um, I'm I, right now. I'm happy. However, I couldn't go. I mean, I couldn't uh, reach that. Uh, that, I mean, the successfully that I had in Iran here. How in, how in, hard was it when you first moved yeah. here? You said earlier in the interview something about you thought you could be a musician and a graphic designer the same way. Mm -hmm. How difficult was the transition to exactly. Canada? You know, I uh, I brought a lot of experience with a lot of talent, is with a lot of uh, you know creativity that I use in, in Iran. Uh, but they don't care about any creativity, at least at that level that I try uh -huh. to 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 work in graphic. Mm. So I just left the graphic design and I focus on music and composing and, and uh, teaching. Do you sometimes think, I mean, because especially in your field, in your, with the Camonche, I would assume there's still some more opportunities in Iran than there would be in Toronto? Mm -hmm. But I didn't focus on Camonche only. Uh -huh. I just tried to to use the orchestration and I use my the different instrument and, and my music. Uh, and also I teach Camonche from all around the board, yes. but it doesn't just cover my all the uh, expenses. So I, uh, th that is because I try to start uh, that job for, mm -hmm. for, for those who they want to have uh, music for themselves, but they, they, 
they cannot find someone oh, who gotcha. ex- to to be expert to create something uh, special for them. So I focus on that. I'm, you know, uh, I'm happy with that job because I sit at home and I just focus on my uh, music stuff. Do you miss your own? Of course, I'm crazy about Iran. I miss every single day I think about Iran, about everything. My family is there. My If things traumatic, dramatically changed in Iran, if the regime goes and something, would you go back? Would you want to take your daughter and uh, go back there? I'm not sure because uh, my daughter right now is 14 years. I've, I do not know when it happens, but it depends on her. Well, I, it's, it's such a great pleasure to have you here. Thank really. you so much. And Thank I, you. I usually ask, um, at least in recent months, I would say, um, how have your, what have your feelings been about the uprising, the revolution that's been happening in Iran? But, uh, but I, I know you have an answer for that because you've, um, you've, you've answered that question musically. You've done a, a new piece with a, a vocalist that, of course, we know here in, um, uh, in Canada named uh, Fadi Badov Davoudi. Uh-huh. Uh, we're going to go out on a um, play some of this. Tell me about this this new piece that you composed and arranged with Fariba. Okay, I will tell you. But first of all, let me just give you my opinion about the politics. Sure. I do not want to participate in poli- politics because you know, artists is better to to stick to their uh, the expertise. You know, sometimes it happened uh, because some people think uh, because they are celebrities, they are actors, they are uh, artists, they are singers, they can uh, lead people. But sometimes it happens it's they, they mistake mm-hmm. uh, about this way. And I do not want to encourage people to go out to, f- to face with regime's bullet because for me, I, I, I cannot yes. go there. I, please open the way. I yes. want to come back. I, 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 I I see this one as a, you know, it's, it's a little bit selfish for me. Mm-hmm. I do not want to participate because of this point. Uh, you don't so believe that we should say silent when schoolgirls are being poisoned. Of course, we need ex- to, yeah. to say. Yes. To, uh, but, you know, the, my problem is with those people who they want to lead people. Mm. Go out. I see. Uh, and, and break everything You don't everything think we down. should be dictating what people inside Iran do from the comfort of Canada. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, I tr- exactly what you said. Uh, I try to say my word b- by music, and um, I compose a music uh, on uh, based on uh, Feridun Mushiri's lyrics. Uh, it, it, it was amazing. It says, "Man ze mardan na umidam bi gaman ayande Iran zanast." So I decided to choose another word because I, I wasn't happy with that <laughs> part okay. of the, the song uh-huh. because uh, you know. There is no movement in around the world without men and women together. Uh, it, it doesn't work. I mean, men and women need to be together. Uh, so, yeah. yeah, I just choose another phrase of this uh, uh-huh. nice uh, piece, uh, replace it with that part. Uh, I, I thought it, it, it matches. Uh, I hope Freedom Mushri is not angry with this uh, <laughs> t- <laughs> replacement. T- tell me about the desire or decision to, or tell me about working with Fadi Ba. When I came here, I, I saw Fadi Ba a lot because uh, he was involved in, in traditional music as, as well as me. Um, she just, uh, one time I saw her and, and, and she just sang this these lyrics with the different, uh, of course, music, the freely, uh, we call it all of us. All of us means uh, there is no meter on, on, on the music and I mean it's not composing it's just freely singing so now when I hear that uh, that lyrics I, I really thought it is very very good potential to to compose I mean uh, for, to work on it so I asked her to sing this nice. song for me yeah nice I hope people uh, Enjoy it. It's time. a great pleasure to have you here. Thank you. Next Thank you time, so the whole interview has to be about what you learned from North Korea. <laughs> because yeah, I don't know. You. I think I've met two people in my whole life. Really? One of them was a journalist who got to, I mean, who, nobody gets to go to North Korea. Yeah, I would tell you. Not that most people wouldn't want to go to North Korea, but, you know, what an experience. Of course. Um, thank you again. We're going to go out on this piece. What is this, the, the revolution piece called? It's called Kaveye Ayande Iran Zanast. Yeah. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Kurashan. Thank, Thank you, so you for much. being Thank here. You.
uh, and uh, it's always a, an honor to watch you play. I, I'm, you. I'm thrilled that you did it in the studio. Thank you. Merci Bye-bye. for that. بسر ما سایه اهری من است هستی ما زیر پای دشمن است سالها رفته است و وحشت برقرار چنان تکرار تیر و بهمن است پیش من این نکته روز روشن است کاوه آینده ایران زن است There you go. Sounds of the new Kurash Babai composition and recording featuring the vocals of Fadiba Dabudi. This is full time for Rook for today. Thank you so much for listening. Our website, rookmedia.com, is where to find us. Thanks to the amazing team who put this show together Roham, Anahita, Parisa, Pega, Meritad, Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting us and sharing our content. Please subscribe if you haven't done so already. You can find me on Instagram at Giangomeshi. Mizun Bashim. <laughs>